Okay, good. So I think I'll start. So today's session is about lung cancer. So lung cancer is the number one cause of death uh, worldwide uh, by cancer in men, and it's the second most common cause in women after breast cancer. It's the third most common cancer in the Czech Republic, and it comprises around 12% of all cancers worldwide. Okay, if you remember from last week, colorectal cancer was about 10%. So the incidence is increasing globally, but there's an ongoing small decline in the Western world, especially in men because of smoking cessation efforts, okay? So the main risk factor, everyone knows this already, so it's the cigarette smoking, okay? So it's really the main one, the most important. It's the major risk factor for lung cancer. So heavy smokers will have a lifetime risk of lung cancer, which is around, it's up until 30%. Uh, On the contrary, never smokers have a lifetime risk of around 1%. And it's responsible for 75% of cases of lung cancer in men and around 50% in women. Okay, so men used to be the ones that were more um, used to smoke more historically. So uh, the incidence of lung cancer in men used to be higher but now they are uh, smoking a bit less. So the incidence is men is decreasing, but in women it's still increasing, okay? So there's always benefit in quitting smoking. So it's very important for us as doctors, no matter what specialty we're on, to always try to refer our patients to smoking cessation clinics. And this is true even for lung cancer patients with uh, early disease, okay? There was this study that, that I'll leave you here in the, um, in the slide that, that did a meta-analysis of uh, nine studies that show that even in patients that already had a lung cancer diagnosis, quitting smoking caused a, re a reduction in the mortality due to uh, every cause, okay? It reduces the chances of developing a second primary tumor, and it reduces the chances of a lung cancer relapse. Okay, so it's always useful in these patients to refer them. In patients with metastatic disease, it's not their prognosis is always going to be worse, so it doesn't really make much sense to try to get them to quit because we know that most of these patients with metastatic disease, even with the advances that we've had in the in the past years they still have a very bad prognosis so let's just let them have that thing that they like so much um, there's a lot of discussion about the e-cigarettes nowadays but the truth is we don't have a long-term follow-up so we don't really know what their effects on the mortality are so for now, we can only say that we have no evidence that they are better, okay? Then other risk factors, exposure to asbestos, mainly for people who develop the pulmonary disease, who develop asbestosis, then exposure to redden, to ionizing radiation, and to air pollution. About the screening, so nowadays we already have enough um, evidence from clinical trials, and there were two main clinical trials in this context that were the Nelson trial, which was conducted in the UK, and the NLST trial, which was conducted in the United States. And they showed us that if we do an annual low-dose CT uh, scan of the chest in high-risk patients, we will have a reduction in lung cancer-related mortality. Okay, this, um, this graph on the right, this was taken from the article that was published on the New England Journal of Medicine uh, of the Nelson study. And you can see in the upper one, you have these two lines. You have the blue line, which is the patients that were randomized to the screening group. And we have the uh, red line, which are the patients that were randomized to the control group. So of course, if we are screening, if we are doing a CT scan annually, it makes sense that we will detect more cancers, okay? So the lung cancer incidence will be higher. But if you look on the graph below, we can see 
that the mortality was higher for the patients that did not do the CT scan annually. So there was a mortality benefit in undergoing screening. So this is something that it's already implemented in some countries. I don't know where you guys are from or if you know something about lung cancer in your countries. I can tell you that I know that in Poland, it's already uh, being done. And I think in the UK as well. I'm not sure if there's anyone here from the UK. Um, in Portugal, it's not implemented yet. It will be maybe over the next five years, but it's something that already has proven to diminish uh, the mortality in these high risk populations. So these are usually patients between 55 and 75 years old with a pack year history of 30 or 20, it's not, it differs uh, according to the different societies or patients that um, were sm uh, stopped smoking less than five years ago. So this will be the future and it's probably will be implemented in the, most of our countries in the, in the next years. For the diagnosis, so uh, as for many other types of cancer, so lung cancer will mostly also present with advanced disease. And we can divide the signs and symptoms into three different categories, okay? So we have the intrathoracic symptoms, which are caused by compression and invasion from the primary tumor. Then we have the extrathoracic symptoms, and then we have the constitutional symptoms. Okay, so the constitu constitutional symptoms are the ones that we always have for advanced malignancy. So this is something that you can always get right on the exam. So the loss of appetite, the weight loss and the fatigue, this is always true. And then for the intrathoracic symptoms, we can have the cough, the hemoptysis, the dyspnea. Sometimes these patients can present with very large pleural effusions and they will have a lot of shortness of breath. Uh, sometimes they can have hoarseness due to, due to invasion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. They can have dysphagia. They can have the superior vena cava syndrome, which is an oncological emergency. And they can have uh, chest pain as well. Then, due to the metastasis, patients with brain metastasis can present with neurological symptoms. Okay, so for instance, headache, vomiting, um, vision loss, uh, seizures, these are frequent in patients with brain metastasis and lung cancer, usually likes to metastasize to, to the brain and to the bone. So this will be something that we'll try to include when uh, staging these patients up front. Then they can also present with bone pain, with pathological fractures, and sometimes with medullary compression, okay? You can see on this figure on the right, this is a case of medullary compression. Usually it's not enough to have the bone metastasis. There's also a, usually a soft tissue component that will impinge on the spinal cord and the patient will usually present with bilateral weakness, um, loss of sensitivity. It, that will depend on the, on the level where the bone uh, metastasis are. And this is also an oncological emergency. This is for future reference. And this is a picture, um, this one on the left, this was taken from a clinical case that uh, was on the New England Journal of Medicine that I think it's very helpful to, to depict how, how the superior vena cava uh, syndrome occurs. So usually these patients will present with neck swelling, facial swelling, they will have an asymmetric um, limb edema, upper limb edema. Uh, they can present also with uh, the feelings of head fullness, headache. They will say, doctor, my uh, neck is much larger. I feel weird when I try to swallow. Uh, sometimes they can have coughing as well. Uh, so this is also something that is uh, urgent to, to address. And I'd like to ask you, and this is, this is something that is a question that sometimes is a bit misleading, but let's see what you what you tell me. And if you know which kind of lung cancer is the most frequent cause of severe vena cava syndrome, if it's non-small cell or if it's small cell lung cancer. So if you have a patient that presents to the emergency department and looks like this uh, old man here, 
And let's assume that he has a lung cancer because other types of cancer as well can cause these. What do you think is most common, non-small cell or small cell? Non-small cell? Yes, and why? Because it's more central, I think. So the answer is correct, but that's not exactly why. Because it's more common for small cell lung cancer to cause superior vena cava syndrome because small cell lung cancer is usually more central and it's usually more aggressive. So it will grow very rapidly into the nearby structures. But because non-small cell lung cancer is much more frequent, as we will see in the next slide. So if you have a patient like this, it's, most com it's more common to be due to non-small cell lung cancer, just because small cell lung cancer is around 15% uh, of all cases of lung cancer, okay? But usually small cell lung cancer is more prone to um, causing this. But because it's more rare, it's not usually the, the right bet. Okay, was I clear? I hope so. Yes. Okay, good. So, as I was saying, in terms of histology, we will divide lung cancer into small cell, 15%, and non-small cell, which are all others. Most frequent in non-small cell are the adenocarcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma. And then we have the large cell, and the others. These are not so frequent. I haven't seen many in clinical practice. For the diagnostic workup, same as always, medical history, physical examination, assessing the patient's performance status, and for the laboratory workup, the complete blood count, the kidney function, liver function, and the bone parameters. Okay, remember that is that is types of cancer usually metastasize to the bone, so they can present with uh, elevations in alkaline phosphatase and with hypercalcemia as well. There are some tumor markers that are said to be associated with lung cancer, like the CEA, the NSE, but they are not, I've never used it in clinical pra practice or I've never seen my colleagues use it. They are not recommended by the, by the guidelines, okay? so. You don't use it in, in the cases of lung cancer, okay? Then chest x-ray, it's always nice to have. The CD scan of the whole body, the brain MRI, it's not possible because sometimes it's a bit harder um, in clinical practice to get the patients to have a brain MRI um, quickly. So usually the CT scan is easier. So you can do it instead of the brain MRI, but the MRI is better. Then bone scintigraphy, because this is a type of cancer that metastasizes to the bone. And in patients that we think that they have localized disease and that they are uh, being proposed to surgery, we can do a, P a, PET, a PET scan to make sure that there is no evidence of disease elsewhere. Then also crucial always um, to differentiate between the histology that will have different treatments is to do the tissue procedures, the bronchoscopy, the endobronchial ultrasound. This will, this will assess the mediastinal lymph nodes to see which ones are enlarged and if they look suspicious to do a biopsy. And then also uh, the CT guided biopsy. This is especially useful for cancers that are Peripherally, peripherally located, where the bronchoscopy is not able to access, you can do a CT-guided biopsy like we're showing here on the right side. If the patient needs a surgery candidate, always has to have an echocardiogram, pulmonary function test, and an EKG. Then the staging on, of non-small cell lung cancer is according to the TNM. You already know it. I'll save this for your studying later, so I'll not go through this now. And it's different uh, for non-small cell lung cancer than for uh, small cell lung cancer, okay? Um, while in the non-small cell, we have the TNM. In small cell lung cancer, 
we only have two stages. It's the limited stage and the extensive stage. Okay, most patients will present with extensive stage. And the difference here for you to remember, you can think that in limited stage, everything will be on one side of the chest. If there's something that is going to the other side, either the primary tumor or the lymph nodes, then it's considered extensive stage. Then the treatment for lung cancer, I think it's even more complex than what I've told you for breast cancer and colorectal. So I checked your white book to see what you had to know. And I think it's mainly the modalities that we use because everything else is it's just, just a bit too much. It's even too much for me sometimes. So even for you, I think it would be very, very confusing. So just know that it depends on the histological subtype. So small cell versus non-small cell on the staging on the presence of driver mutations, and this is only true, and it's only done for non-small cell, on the PDL1 status in non-small cell lung cancer. And this is for us to know if we can use immunotherapy or not. Then on patient-related factors, performance status, always, this is always true. Patients comorbidities, lung and heart function, especially for patients with early stage disease where we might consider going to surgery and then for patients' uh, preferences, okay? So what treatment modalities do, modalities do we have? This is the picture that I've shown you in the first session. So for lung cancer, we have surgery, we have chemo radiation, so chemotherapy and radiation at the same time. We have our classical chemotherapy, we have the targeted agents. These are, these are the ones that we use for patients who have mutations. These are usually patients that are uh, non-smokers or that have smoked only a little during their lifetime. And then we have the immunotherapy. So surgery, it's mainly for patients with localized disease with no spread or just little spread to the mediastinal lymph nodes. So it's the standard treatment for patients with stage one and stage two disease. These patients must be fit enough to undergo surgery. They will have to do these exams that I've told you previously in the workup. This can do, uh, be done through open thoracotomy or through vets. And the patients with resected that were operated and they were a stage two or three, they should always receive adjuvant chemo, okay? I think this is enough for you to know about surgery. And there are different types of surgery that you can do. You can do a lobectomy, you can do a pneumonectomy. This is not, this is not common, okay? If you think that the patient will, be, uh, will need to have a pneumonectomy, maybe you will choose a different type of, of treatment. And you can also do a wedge resection where only part of the lobe is removed. Then for patients, some patients we want to treat with curative intents, but they are not uh, candidates for surgery because of comorbidities, uh, performance status, and so on. Or sometimes they have more advanced disease where surgery wouldn't be able to get rid of all of that. So in these patients, we choose to do chemo radiation. We can do it in one of two ways. We can do it concurrent. So we do chemo and radiotherapy at the same time, or we can do chemo radiation sequentially where we start with chemo and then the patient does the radiation after, okay? It is also the mainstay of treatment for limited stage small cell lung cancer, okay? So small cell lung cancer patients are usually um, not operated. So when they have limited stage or early disease, they will do chemo radiation. The classical chemotherapy. In, in the case of lung cancer, it can be done in different uh, settings. It can be done in the neoadjuvant, adjuvant with radiotherapy, as I talked previously, or in the palliative setting, okay? The most commonly used drugs that we use are cisplatin and carboplatin, okay, one or the other. Usually carboplatin has a bit more tolerable side effect profile, but cisplatin usually prefer it if the patient is fit enough. 
we have docetaxel, pemetrexed, vinohalbine, and gemcitabine. We usually do a combination of these drugs, okay, depending on the histological subtype and so on. Then, molecular testing is part of the workup for patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer because we want to look for driver mutations. This is especially important in patients with adenocarcinoma. These are the ones that more, more frequently will have these mutations. In these patients, we can offer some TKIs. These are targeted agents against that mutation that the person has. They will usually induce long-term uh, responses. So the patients will have better outcomes than those who have no mutations and are only treated with chemo plus or minus immunotherapy. They are more convenient because they uh, are given in tablets and they are usually more uh, friendly in terms of side effects. And then I'll, I'll leave you here with some examples. So we've seen here in, these, um, in this chart that um, many patients will have no um, mutations. Then the most frequent are the KRAS and the EGFR mutations, and then the ALK rearrangements, and then the others are much more rare. So in the case for patients for EGFR mutations, we can do ozimertinib or erlotinib, afatinib. Patients with ALK rearrangements, we can do alectinib, crizotinib, lorlatinib. These will always have the inib uh, ending. And for patients with the ROS1 rearrangement, we can also do the crizotinib. These are all tyrosine kinase inhibitors, okay? And they belong to this class of targeted agents against these specific mutations. Then, um, lastly, immunotherapy is something that has changed the landscape of treatment of many types of cancer, and lung cancer is definitely one of them, okay? So particularly in the metastatic setting. What immunotherapy does is um, making our immune system recognize the cancer cells again and act against them. This is used in the metastatic setting, as I've told you before. Most patients will do it with chemotherapy as well. So they, they will do chemotherapy plus immunotherapy at the same time. This has shown benefits in terms of reducing lung cancer mortality. And some, some patients can even do immunotherapy alone, okay? Always remember that immunotherapy even though it's better tolerated than chemotherapy and the serious side effects are a bit more rare, they can still happen, okay, and they can be very serious. It can affect any organ or any system of organs, okay? It's just, if your teachers ask you, it's anything that comes to mind, okay? So liver, kidney, uh, skin, uh, the colitis is the itis of any organ is always correct okay and there's this graph here that i'll leave you um for for you to study later that shows you more or less in which timing uh these side effects can occur but they are more rare so it's better for the patients to do immunotherapy than chemo so this was all for lung cancer um I prepared a bit of a quiz for you guys, something just very easy. So just for the last session today. So I'll be very happy if you try to answer. I promise these are very easy questions for you. So first question. So the CEA is a tumor marker for which types of cancer? So A, colorectal breast cancer, ovarian cancer. B, colorectal breast cancer, lung cancer. C, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer. Does anyone want to guess? It's B. Yes, right. It's B, colorectal, breast cancer, lung cancer. This is a bit tricky because, you know, it can be linked with lung cancer, but 
we don't use it in clinical practice. In colorectal cancer, it's very important. In breast cancer, it can be used as well for monitoring treatment efficacy. Then, which staging system or systems are used for gynecological cancers? A, the FIGO staging, the B, the Ann Arbor staging, or the C, the TNM plus the FIGO staging? I will not fail anyone. You can just try to guess. Come on, guys. Okay, so for gynecological cancers, we use, this was on the first session, okay? So we use both the FIGO yeah, staging. Both. Yes, that's right. We use both of them. Um, most frequently uh, the FIGO, but we actually use the TNM as well. So it, it, the, the, the TNM for ovarian and cervical cancer also exists. That's right. It's not best, okay. So this one has no has no option, so you really have to just tell me. What is the goal of conversion therapy? Okay, remember we talked about the, the curative therapy, the palliative intent, all of that. What is the goal of conversion therapy? And we've talked about it in the case for colorectal cancer, for metastatic colorectal cancer. I think it's to be able to remove a tumor that is on that was before unable to be removed because it was spreading all over the place. Yeah, so that's 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 it basically. So we most often do this, for instance, in the case of metastatic colorectal cancer with metastasis to the liver, uh, where we think that the the metastases are not resectable up front, but we can do we can do some chemo and try to get the cancer to downstage to get a bit uh, smaller, and then we can try to do surgery. So we will uh, convert a cancer that was was initially diagnosed as metastatic or unresectable to something that we can try to cure with surgery. Okay, was it clear? Then, what are the biological subtypes of breast cancer? So, A, laminal and triple negative. B, medullary, HER2 positive and triple negative. And C, laminal, HER2 positive and triple negative. I say C. Yes, right, perfect. So the laminals are the one who are the ones who express um, hormone receptors. And what is a triple negative breast cancer? HER negative estrogen and progesterone. So uh, HER two negative yes. progesterone negative and estrogen negative. Exactly. Perfect. What exam is the gold standard for screening for colorectal cancer? A, CT colonography, B, total colonoscopy, and C, the fecal occult blood testing? Also uh, B. Yes. And what's the next step for a patient with a positive fecal occult blood test? Colonoscopy. Yes. Okay. So guys, that was all. Thank you all for coming to the sessions. I hope they were helpful and I wish you the best of luck for the future. And I think all of these PowerPoints will be sent to you by MIMSA. And feel free to email me if you have any questions on these topics or any others on oncology, okay? Thank you.